This episode is brought to you by LMNT. Healthy hydration isn't just about drinking water, it's about water plus electrolytes. It makes sense, you lose both water and sodium when you sweat. Both need to be replaced to prevent muscle cramps, headaches and energy dips. But most people only replace the water. Why? Well, because since the 1940s we've been told to drink 8 glasses of water per day, thirsty or not. Drinking beyond thirst is a bad idea. It dilutes blood electrolyte levels, especially sodium, which leads to headaches, low energy, cramps, confusion, or even worse. This low sodium situation called hyponatremia is very common amongst endurance athletes, shift workers, and those who work outside in the heat, leading to thermal stress. The solution isn't to stop drinking water, it's to drink water plus electrolytes. This is where LMNT comes in. Just mix this flavor, electrolyte drink mix into your water bottle and you're good to go. It's got no sugar or artificial junk, just electrolytes. LMNT has your electrolyte needs covered. Former research biochemist Rob Wolf and Keto Gains founder Tyler Cartwright and Louis Villasener formulated LMNT to provide the optimal ratios of sodium, potassium and magnesium for health, performance and energy. They also formulated LMNT to please your palate. Many different flavors such as orange salt, citrus salt, watermelon salt and many many more. Just head over to LMNT to find out. Or better still, go down to the show notes, click on the link, the sleep for performance link, to get um, to click on this and get your free promotional pack where you can get a taster pack and no questions asked refund policy as well. You don't even need to send it back. So check it out at LMNT in the show notes. Welcome back to the Sleep for Performance podcast. Today I am joined by Batman and Robin. The Batman and Robin of Twitter, the Batman and Robin of ChatGBT. We have the Honourable Dr. Jonathan Shrest. And Jesse, are we are we doctor title yet or professor or what are we? No, I'm still just a lowly graduate student who's <laughs> trying to finish his dissertation and get out of the hell that is graduate school. So I am a peon. Uh, so I guess I'm his <laughs> Robin, which he will hold over me forever. He can be the Batman today. The Batman. So we have the uh, French Quebec, uh, Quebecois Batman, the man who sounds yeah, like GSP. <laughs> I'm not scared at all. Yeah, I'm, I'm scared the Batman today. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Joe Rogan, the alien are coming for me. Uh, Jonathan, this is your, like, I think, 15th appearance on the podcast. So welcome back. You're the leading light at the moment. Um, so we might just do a f- we are going to talk about sleep and performance in professional athletes. We did have a precursor conversation for a half an hour on chat GBT and UFC athletes, but we're going to jump into this paper called sleep and performance in professional athletes that was published recently in current sleep medicine reports. And uh, the section editor was our good old friend, Mr. or Professor Michael Gradner as well. So um, this is a good paper. So we'll delve into this in a minute. But by way of introduction, uh, Jonathan, you've been on before, but would you mind giving us just a quick two minute version background on yourself before we head over to Jesse for an extended intro? So a very quick refresher. So uh, I'm a uh, PhD in psychology and right now I'm doing a uh, postdoc in uh, kinesiology at the University of Calgary. I'm working with Dr. Samuel at the Center for Sleep and Human Performance. And I'm working mostly with student athletes and trying to validate a questionnaire with them and investigate their sleep in order to make them perform better. Excellent. Trebion, merci. That's the end of my French. Jesse. Uh, so I am Jesse, Jesse Cook. I'm a graduate student in my sixth year feels like it's been my entire life uh, in a clinical (laughs) psych PhD program at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I'm originally from Phoenix, Arizona in the States and went to school at the University of Arizona and joined Dr. Richard Bootson's, uh, the late Dr. Richard Bootson's sleep research lab during my senior year, which led me to wanting to have a career as a researcher in sleep. Currently, again, finishing my PhD, I study a specific sleep disorder principally in my research, known as idiopathic hypersomnia or hypersomnia disorder, people who have excessive daytime sleepiness. But I have other research programs, if you will, related to wearable sleep technology. And of course, the influence of sleep and circadian health on not just performance, but the well-being of athletes. And I'm pleased to report that my time in the cold is coming to a conclusion. I recently matched at the Palo Alto VA, so I'll be 
moving in about six months to California, and I do not think that I'll be enticed to return to the frozen tundra that is Madison, Wisconsin. And Ian, always a pleasure. Thank you for having me on. That's great. So um, so Arizona to Madison and then back over now to California. So Palo Alto, is that like, that's outside San Francisco. That's the kind of classic um, <clears throat> tech bubble area that people live in. Is that, yeah, that, definitely. That's sort of, so yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's a little bit south of San Francisco in between San Jose and San Francisco as the major cities. But yeah, the the I think the term people use is Silicon Valley. Uh, I'm not fully versed in the tech bubble per se, but I will say there is some nice alignment with my interest in working with industry and being out there for clinical internships. So I'm excited to polish up this degree and uh, eventually actually start, start making some real money for the work that I actually do. <laughs> yeah, well, it's okay. No time you'll be as rich as Jonathan up there. Because people think like um, when you have a PhD, you're rich. I remember... Um, I was doing my master's in engineering and one of the guys goes, oh, here comes the professor coming back and he's Maserati. And I was like, what? Oh, these guys are loaded. And I was like, how much do you think these guys get paid? Oh, professor. Oh, he'd be on like half a million. I was like, man, go on to the website of University of New South Wales and have a look because all the salaries are disclosed and see what an associate professor makes. And he looked up and went, I think it was like 125 or something, 130, whatever it was. Geez, I make more than that. I was like, exactly. You think these academics that make a fortune? They don't. But when you've been a grad student for a long time and you make some decent money, even around 100, that feels like a lot of money. So that's why that's why some people think it's a lot, but it feels like a lot. <laughs> Amen on that front. And hopefully that changes, but that has certainly dissuaded me from an academic track. Uh, you just do not get reimbursed for the amount of effort and time you put in. So I feel bad for so many like Jonathan who have gone the academic journey track. I myself probably will try and find a harmonious intersection of clinical work and maybe in the private practice sector with yeah. some sort of like industry research role, something like that. Yeah, I think that's becoming more and more popular. I see a lot of people want to do that sort of like, you know, two or three days a week doing research, two or three days a week doing consulting. Um, because, yeah, it just gives them a little bit more kind of hedges their bets, a little bit more money, gives you a bit more flexibility. Um, but yeah, I think I also as well, it just depends on what you like doing. You know, I like, I like, I like a bit of a mix, having an adjunct role and, and, uh, doing predominantly more consulting and then just kind of using it as a virtuous circle. But I think uh, it just depends what you like doing, regardless of the money. I think if you like doing what you're doing, it's, it doesn't feel like a job. Like I know some people who are being full-time in academia for 10, 15 years and are like, I can't believe I get paid. Yeah. It's not as good as industry money, but I can't believe I get paid to sit around reading papers and writing papers and teaching. It's, it's like a dream. It doesn't even feel like a job. It just feels like, you know, it's, it's good. You just get to do it, run your own show and no one's annoying you. So there is, there is, there is benefits, I suppose, regardless of money. There's a lot of, you know, it is, it is quite privileged, I think in, in a way, I don't know if people try on the word privilege, but I think we are quite privileged to be able to sit back and have these conversations, you know? Straight up, truly. And that's the allure, if you will, to the academic track is the flexibility of yeah. your schedule, right? If I want to go trail running or hiking or whatever it may be and not start my day until 10 or 11 a.m., well, that's okay. I don't have to be sitting at a computer not doing any work at 9 a.m. like many other mm. traditional jobs. And there is a beauty to that. Uh, but I will say, Jonathan, if you're willing to pay me to be your Robin on Twitter, <laughs> I'm happy to change my Twitter handle but at least six figures is needed on this one. So that's that's my offer at this point. Yeah. It will be easy. Six Canadian figure. <laughs> yeah. Zero, 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 zero. There are six figures for you. <laughs> uh, all right. Enough shit talking. Let's get into it. Um, Jesse, this paper, this review, can you give us a bit of a background and the scope and the aims of this paper, Sleep and Performance in Professional Athletes? Definitely. So current sleep medicine reports really focuses on recent publications. So we were approached, Jonathan actually principally was approached to produce a review that focused on relevant research within the last five years that pertain to sleep and performance in professional athletes, which naturally winnows the available data when you start thinking about the various tiers of athletes and the various characterizations. And I imagine we're going to spend some time talking about the complexity of the characterization of athletes. 
So Jonathan and I set out to review, or I guess compile as a starting point, the relevant research. And I think we identified somewhere between like, I think like 38 articles. Maybe we missed a few, Ian. Uh, but relatively <laughs> speaking, I think we found a pretty good haul for the last five years on studies that were principally looking at in some way or another some relationship between sleep and performance in a sample of professional athletes. This varied greatly between like professional rugby teams, between national basketball association teams, a lot of different sports got lumped into what we mm -hmm. were trying to uh, assess here or review, if you will, in a narrative format. And Jonathan and I had many meetings. So we talked through what we kept unearthing from the articles and tried to compile some major themes, if you will, on the various components that we were kind of landing on when reviewing these, these um, pieces of literature. And we organized the manuscript into sections that were really looking at the effects of things that sleep affects directly, whether that be the training, the performance, the recovery. We also looked in a different section on how those things affect sleep. And then we also decided to produce a different section of the, the manuscript that reviewed current kind of strategies and interventions that are being explored um, that within an athlete population, within a professional athlete population may have some benefit on sleep. And so that was kind of the scope. And uh, again, we landed on about 38 articles, perhaps there could have been 41 or so. Uh, and we tried to, at our best, synthesize the available literature into salient points. Mm -hmm. um, and we landed on some major themes and really unearthed that, well, sports vary greatly. And we need to take that into account when it comes to the various travel that people go through for sport the various training demands that people go through through sport that's going to vary greatly based on the sport, the timing of comp competition in general, and how that's going to affect sleep, all these different factors, we definitely became top of mind for us that it really isn't about sport and athletic or sleep and athletic performance in sport in general, but we need to start distilling this down to within specific sports. Yeah. Uh, and that was kind of kind of a concluding theme in our summary. Uh, Jonathan, is there anything I left out there? Or do you feel like I, I covered that completely? No, you covered everything that was uh, to be covered in the scope and aims of what the uh, <clears throat> manuscript was all about. And I think you did summarize it very well as to moving forward. Every sport is unique, unique in its sense. And the best proof we had in, in uh, reviewing our, uh, when we did review the manuscript is the, the, the categorization of team and individual sport. For example, I'm going to take soccer, so football, the real football, not the American football. Uh, they look at performance with the number of pass they do uh, throughout the game. If you want to compare this with another team sport, because we lump them always together, there's not a single other sport that you will con uh, that you will aggregate the number of as they do either in rugby, in ice hockey, in basketball. So this just shows you that every sport has their their unique feature that may represent a component of uh, performance, regardless if it is a team or an individual sport. So this is where we want to shift the discussion moving forward in in sport and performance and sleep is what is the sport what we're looking at and regardless of the category we may apply to it and then we look at their sleep culture and their actual traveling culture and so on and so forth and now how can we individualize an approach to improve or enhance their performance yeah i think there's lots of lots of things to talk in there um but before we get into all those different variables um this categorization of athletes this comes up a lot when we write papers professional elite sub elite Olympian, um, amateur, serious amateur, elite amateur, um, recreational. Um, and I've, we've never been able to sort of land on a, a definition. I know we could spend hours here doing that, but for the purpose of this, um, and the reason I'm asking this is because I often run into people like that are in their 30s, 40s, or 50s and go, yeah, well, basically, I'm a professional athlete. 
I'm like, do you get paid? No. But I train like every day of the week like a pro. No, you're not a professional athlete. You're a middle-aged man going through a crisis that's trying to do a triathlon. And you have a job and you got four kids. Relax. You're not a pro. And then, you know, people start blowing smoke up to them as well, going, yeah, you're like a pro because you have a six-pack. So um, do you guys have a definition of a professional athlete for the purpose of this review? Truthfully, I would say that it's heterogeneous and it's largely based in many ways on the designation of the manuscript itself. Mm. Uh, but more so when we when we pooled these together, it was explicitly stated that these individuals were in some ways getting compensated for their efforts. It, it was it was very clear that it was a um more than just a hobby or recreational activity or an identity component to you, but more of a vocational pursuit. Uh, that was clear based on kind of the sample characteristics in the description there. But as you pointed out, Ian, this, these are blurred boundaries. Mm. When you start looking at like titles and sample formation, there'd be times when I would go back to Jonathan and be like, hey, so this Australian rules football team it seems to be like a proportional mismatch or a proportional um, distribution between elite and professional. Like, where do we label that? Like, what do we do when it's not always linear on that front or clear? So it goes back to the complexity of it. And kind of what you're alluding to is the necessity to have more clear defined standards and guidelines on what these definitions really pertain to is somebody who's not necessary, who, who works a nine to five job Monday through Friday, but shows up in competitive marathons to actually compete, perform podium and mm -hmm. actually make money. Is that a professional athlete? I don't know. <laughs> Cause generally speaking, they're probably going to be labeled an elite athlete because it's not their primary financial source, if you will. Yeah. But that seems to not maybe be the best way to designate this. Yeah, it's very, um, it's very difficult. Uh, Jonathan just sent through a paper there and I, I've seen similar categories before Jonathan, but again, I think still they provide a nice framework and buckets or bins for us to put things in. But as Jesse just alluded to there in his example, they can become very blurred, you know, depending on what's going on, semi-pro and so on. So it does become difficult. It is difficult. I think a professional athlete will be defined as someone in major sports. So we have our five major sport here in, in the United States and Canada. I think Australia will have their major sport. Europe has their major sport. Africa has their major sport. These will be the easy one to categorize as pro athletes. Then it's, as Jesse mentioned, so someone working a job nine to five and then running marathon and winning or make or placing in a position where you do research, uh, receive a bonus performance how do you categorize that? So me professional, professional, or do you swing them back into elite athlete? Because then where is the lane or the boundaries between a pro athlete and a elite athlete? Mm -hmm. And so this is what makes it hard in the, uh, in the uh, athletic uh, literature is too many people lump the elite athlete as a big umbrella of, well, I'm performing well for my age category. Therefore I'm elite. So do we need a, a, a definition for eliteness according to group age? Do we need a, a definition of eliteness or professional by, by group age and so on and so forth? So that's what makes it hard when you do a review after that is, well, I'm looking at this group of a uh, football player and, well, okay, so I'm looking at a group of 14 and 15-year-old. They haven't been playing at any professional level yet, but they're called elite. They're elite for their age. Of course, you have the outliers such as Messi and Ronaldo that they were truly elite at this age, but how many of them are they? Yeah. Okay, so within this review then, Jesse, um, when we look at, and we look at, say, let's look at, I'm going to call it the base factors at the moment, the home factors. So before we start moving and traveling and having games, what sort of relationship or impact are we seeing with training, such as time of day of training, the type of training and so on? And then obviously there's going to be different categories of athletes. Um, like we said before, and I've said in this podcast before, it's one thing, you know, going for a 10K jog, you know, mid-morning versus going sparring, um, MMA, jiu-jitsu, 
you know, boxing, whatever it might be, at eight or nine o'clock at night, because they're going to have negative factors in your ability to be able to fall asleep and so on. And then is there is there multiple sessions a day? We see this a lot in combat sports. People want to get up early and do running because they've watched Rocky. You know, all this sort of stuff goes on. Or is there two a day with swimming, which we've seen in some of Shona Halson's research, early morning swim start times, you know, that are just a cultural hang up from swimming where people swim early in the morning, then they swim again at night and could be covering 12 kilometers in a day. So we have all of these different things. And as we said before, it's difficult to lump them in. So you've got like different teams, individual athletes, male versus female, age groups, different types of sports, contact, non-contact, all of these types of things. And I know that's a big question to ask around training times, but that's probably, um, I'll give you those kind of hour stakes if you want to color in between those lines and see what, see what you found. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll do my best with that, that framework. I but just wanted to wrap up the last segment real quick on the fact of, I feel like Bobby <laughs> Jones, who's a golfer, former golfer, you know, now deceased in the United States captures this complexity very well because Bobby Jones preferred to be an amateur golfer his entire career. He was a lawyer but he was also one of the best golfers on tour at that time. And does that make him a professional or an elite athlete? It really doesn't. It's unclear, right? Like he's mm -hmm. the best performer on the professional tour, but he chose to not have that designation. And so I would be more apt to label him professional, even though he's technically elite based on characterization, but this is kind of the complexity of the nuance of characterization. To answer your question, Ian, it's, it's a beautiful question. And I think this is where we can actually have most influence, right? Um, so travel is something that's going to vary greatly between sport, but the dynamics of the training and the stress, those factors that are unrelated to travel in many ways, just the fact that, you know, you go and go and play college football at Alabama and you have two a days with morning workouts and, e and evening workouts and classes in between or whatever it may be, that is a totally different regime than say like somebody who's got a uh, running session in the morning and a stressing session in the evening. There's still two periods, but they're a whole different demands. Mm -hmm. And so to view that as comparable is, is a mistake in many ways. So we have all these issues of from a professional level, the timing of practices for sure is going to vary between sport and is going to have a huge influence on somebody's wake up time. For instance, if you have to be in a team meeting or an individual meeting with your coaches at 7 a.m., well, that may lead you to having a desired wake up time at 5 a.m., or that may lead you to having early morning awakening because you are kind of primed to be anxious about yeah. missing your early morning workout. yeah, And so we're already putting a constraint on your rise time there that's going to influence sleep negatively. And similarly, depending on the sport, we've talked about slightly the variations in practice dynamics and so on, but some have really late into the evening meetings where you're reviewing game film or whatever it may be. And that's going to put a constraint or lead to a factor that's going to negatively influence your sleep at night. They also may have different training periods at night or different routines, you know, maybe in a collegiate setting, they schedule a 6 to 8 p.m. workout because they want to be mindful of class schedule during the day. And thus, we're now inviting in something that could create pre-sleep arousal due to a heightened cortisol response that's going to negatively influence sleep. So that's all to say that, like, there's the influence of actually competitive performance of the stress, the anxiety preceding event. There's the influence of travel for sure, because we're going to get into like circadian misalignment, mm -hmm. time zone change, and our biology not matching up to the actual environment that we're performing. But even ignoring those factors, just generally speaking, on the day to day basis of training and the timing of all these things, whether that be team meetings or actually principal physical activity, these things will have some influence, mostly negative on one's sleep ability and quality because of certain constraints it puts on our sleep period and also perhaps differential effects on our physiology due to uptick in certain arousal levels prior to the sleep period. Yeah. That's um that's interesting because 
it's not just the timing of those sessions as well from a group, but then we could even further categorize it. Um, Jonathan alluded to earlier on about individual characteristics. Then if you've got a team, let's say, I don't know, pick the sport, NFL, soccer, whatever you want to call it, uh, rugby, you've got 30, 40 people in that, you're going to have variation in chronotype as well. So how is that going to further affect the larks versus the owls? The owls are all buzzing at 6, 7, 8 o'clock in the evening, love training then. The larks are nodding off. And then we have the added complexity then of potentially, which we can talk about a bit more as well, is sleep disorder, sleep problems, or other additional factors outside, <clears throat> which is family or other, other commitments or stresses that may be happening. So all of these things are very difficult to um to 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 use and 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 but they should be considered as factors when you're scheduling training times. But on that, Jesse, do you do you think that the training times should match the performance time? So my example is. If we are a rugby team and our game is at 7 p.m. on a Friday night and we're playing until 9 p.m., should our training time match that or should it be close to it or does it even matter? It's a phenomenal question. Uh, I, in practice, I don't think it's plausible, first of all, right? I just think from a, 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 a scheduling capacity standpoint and so on, I think you're going to run into too many logistical hurdles, but I don't think it's truly really necessary. I think competition and and uh, training are largely can be considered distinctly different from a timing perspective. Um, I generally do believe that you would have better outcomes if you trained at the exact same time that you were going to perform. But I don't think that is logistically sustainable. So I think you would actually do more hazard, more harm by trying to rigidly implement that. Hmm. Um that's kind of my take home that it's not necessarily a necessary component it could be enhancing, but probably one that won't have significant effects. Jonathan, what do you think on that front? Well, so it will, again, it will go back to the type of sport. So I'm pretty sure Ian, because you're a big MMA fan. So they're going across the globe and they, so they were in, in Abu Dhabi for some time during yeah. the, the pandemic and, and sometimes this meant that they were fighting at 2 a.m. local time. And so trying to train an athlete to perform at 2 a.m. in the morning, you're not going to have that. If you make them train at 2 a.m. in the morning repeatedly, you're not going to enhance their performance. You're just going to sleep deprive them and emperor their sleep to a level where they may believe they're getting accustomed to it. But that's the catch-22. Everyone does go that goes under some sort of sleep restriction subjectively believe they're getting adapted to it. But objectively speaking, there's a good research on that. They're always declining and decreasing and impairing very slowly, of course. Mm. But nevertheless, they are declining and decreasing. And you know as well as I do that in pro sport, 1% difference is the difference between being knocked out in the MMA or being submitted or winning. So this is one of the perfect sport to actually allude to that question. And to just give you one other example I went through is a coach, their uh, national team final was at, at 7.30 a.m. Don't ask me why they put a final, national final at 7.30 a.m. So he asked us, well, should we get used to wake up at 5.30 in the morning? Well, this goes again with the chronotype. Some of your athlete, because this was a team sport, some of your athlete may do well, but maybe half of your athlete won't do well. You're, you're in a, a student athlete world, university sport. Most of them will probably be night owl preference chronotype. So no, you need to arrive at that competition with the biggest bank of sleep possible. Same goes for the, the professional athlete in MMA. Do not get up at 2 a.m. or midnight to actually train at 2 a.m. because your, fi your fight mm. it will be around 2 a.m. This makes absolutely no sense from a biological perspective. It will only be sleep restriction accumulated throughout days, weeks, even months if they, they start a training camp before and they will just arrive there depleted. So what, what on this point, um, what do you guys think about gradual adjustment? And this is a term I often use with athletes. And we'll use the MMA example because it is quite extreme and it is individual. And it's a little bit more simpler for us to articulate this. And this could be MMA, boxing, whatever it might be. So typically like a fight card will be between sort of 7 p.m. in general 
all the way up to 1 a.m. in the morning by the time the main event is over. So if you've got a fighter on the main card, it's typically they're going to be fighting somewhere between 10 p.m. and 1 a.m. And so if they're um, a, a lark chronotype, they're going to be up very early in the morning. So we might want to start kind of phase adjusting them across the training camp of six weeks where we don't want to be getting up early in the morning. So we don't want to maximize the chronotype for training in the camp. Maybe outside of camp, it's fine. You know, and there's other factors going on with family and, you know, media and sponsorship and whatever it might be. That might be fine. But during the fight camp, we want to start gradually moving them forward. And the other thing we want to try and do as well, as I often say, is that with this gradual adjustment is we need at least 12 hours, if not 14 hours between sessions to allow for adequate sleep opportunity, eight to 10 hours, the ability to have a meal, wash, relax, refresh, and have a little bit of downtime. So ideally 14 hours, but minimum sort of 12 because what we often see in these type of activities, and this actually happens in some professional teams as well, they'll play the game or they'll they'll train in the evening, finish at eight or nine o'clock, and then be back in the morning at seven o'clock in the morning. That's like a 10 hour break. That's including like, you know, rehydration, food, family, watch an episode of Game of Thrones, whatever it is. And then they're like, why aren't you getting enough sleep, guys? It's like, well, hey, this isn't a sleep issue. This is a mathematical issue. And this is like grade one mathematics. Like you got 24 hours in a day. And you've taken away like, you know, 15 of them. And now you want me to eat, shower, you know, go to the bathroom, talk to my family, watch a show and relax and maybe stretch, which leaves me about seven hours. And now you want me to get eight hours into that. Well, guess what? It doesn't work. So I often talk about gradual adjustment, but also giving that buffer as well for the next one. So basically, if we are going to train at the evening at, let's say, eight, nine, ten, then we're not going to start the next day until maybe 10 a.m. So we're having that slight gradual adjustment as opposed to trying to maximize the chronotype. Um, so you mightn't fully adjust to it, but as we move into the training camp, we start moving a bit more forward. And then in the week of the fight, then we potentially start getting more aligned to that fight time. Um, and that's without the complexity of travel, Jonathan, because your example of Fight Island was is 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 bang on. And I think in the UK, they're going to be having a fight card that's going to be on at 3 a.m. or something as well. They've done that in Sweden before where the main card, the prelim started at 2 a.m. So we will have these crazy kind of fight times, which are all over the over the shop. Like the one in Perth here recently, 284 in Perth, um, the fighters, I think, were getting picked up at the hotel at half four, five a.m. to go and fight on the, the fight pass prelims. Yeah. This is this is brutal. And again, so I do I do agree with your point that gradually delaying or advancing to mirror the uh, the final fight hour, but again. If you're trying to optimize to a 2 a.m. fight time, if you're a lark, and let's say you're a very down to her lark nine to five type of sleeper, you're shifting dramatically. Mm -hmm. I would try to shift you as much as I can while monitoring objectively your 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 yes. your reaction time and all. And when I see something where a, a boundary or a limit you cannot cross then my mind is shifting automatically to fatigue management. So I will probably use yeah. coffee and so on and so forth to give you that little push to that 2 a.m. and strategic napping and so on and so forth. But trying at all costs to delay everything, uh, someone who advance him, it's, it's that kind of gray area we're, we're entering. Hmm. What do you think, Jesse? I think that's well said. I mean, in those extreme scenarios, as you both impact, like, I don't think it makes a ton of sense to try and adjust somebody's rhythm to best align with that extreme performance time per se. Yet there are scenarios. I'm a full supporter of the kind of gradual adjustment approach to improve alignment with your circadian rhythm to enhance performance. And I think like an example would be say like Tom Brady, right? Like, this is a guy who clearly at this point is a lark, likes to go to bed early. And perhaps one week, he's got a 12, a noon, you know, 12 p.m. game. And then maybe he's got a bye week. And he's got an, a Sunday night or Monday night football game, some sort of primetime late night game where he may actually struggle sometimes. That would be an athlete or has lesser performance. He never struggles. He just has lesser performance relative to Tom Brady standards. Um, perhaps that's a scenario where I would actually want to actually gradually really try and make concerted effort to adjust this person's rhythm because there's enough time to do it. And it's also acute. 
Whereas like in this extreme scenario, we're dra- we have to drastically shift this rhythm. Mm-hmm. And that's not really desirable for the well-being of the individual. Sure, they may have some performance benefits, maybe. That's not actually like fully quantified, right? Or certain, uh, determined. And we just want to be careful that we're not having hazardous effects by like trying to shift these people to having, you know, wake biology at 2, 3 a.m. Yeah. when they're eventually going to have to return to a state of traditional living. And Jesse, I think you're right. When you, when you take on Tom Brady, and this is a perfect example of gradually shifting someone within a, a uh, sport team or team sport. So what do you do? You pick the uh, major uh, section of your team that are lark and you shift them and then you're going against the culture of the sport. Because again, in, in, in American football or, or ice hockey in Canada, there is morning training. But because you want to shift gradually towards a uh, late evening game. So I think this is where it will become fundamental I'm uh, moving forward for teams to have circadian specialist or clinician and sleep clinician on board, not only at the beginning of the season to provide a one, two hour sleep session of you should not and avoid coffee after afternoon, please. And no electronic device, guys. I think this is part of the answer as to how we will implement these one, two percent changes uh, in the middle of the season for uh, the entire team to perform on D-Day. It's, it's interesting you say that, Jonathan, because I actually would advocate that there is, um, I, in my head, I call it the three plus one. I think that uh, I don't advocate that teams need a full-time sleep scientist or chronobiologist. If they want it, that's great, and you can offer people those jobs. I don't think you need a full-time, but I think there's three components plus one that you need to do, um, and probably at a couple of times in the season. I think one, at the start of the season or the off-season or pre-season or before a fight camp or whatever it is, you need to sit down and you need to get some objective measures of people's sleep using wearable technology at a minimum and you need a minimum of three weeks of data. Not this night-to-night reaction. Oh, I didn't sleep. I only slept four hours last night freaking out. We need at least a 21-day window. Second, what we need is we need an assessment of the chronotype using some questionnaires, which then could be objectively assessed against that actigraphy data. Because what I have found in a few papers in recreation athletes and professional is that when we try to define their chronotype of questionnaires and then what their sleep wake behavior is, it's two separate things. And what I've been finding in recreation athletes, they're answering the chronotype questionnaire as to their preference. Yeah, I'd rather get up and do training early in the morning because, you know, I got to work and whatever. So there's all these caveats in their head, but they're not truly a morning type person because on their days off, they're not getting up till half seven or eight, eight o'clock in the morning, which pushes them more towards late morning types or even intermediates. So I think, first of all, we need objective measures of sleep for three weeks. We need to assess their chronotypes. And then either through a system of objective questionnaires or a series of questionnaires plus the actigraphy data and maybe individual consultation, we may need to assess people for the prevalence of sleep problems and disorders using like a level two PSG, which we can do in their home. So those three things should be done to start of the season. From that then, that's when you can start working out, I think, one, you can work out the, the optimal training times across the season because you can go back to the coach and say, look, the majority of this team here is a lark chronotype. You need to be getting two training windows in, one at like nine to 10 in the morning and then maybe you know three to four o'clock. But as you push past six or 7 p.m., you're not going to get much out of these guys. And if you want to sit around reviewing tape at night with larks, forget about it because you're going to be like cookie dough just sitting there going, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're better off reviewing tape maybe at like, you know, 11 or 12. So do a training session, half an hour break, shower, get some food and be eating while you're watching the training video because they're going to be actually cognitively engaged. So let's maximize those times. And I think that's what needs to be done. And then on top of that, um, we need to start treating those people with the sleep problems and disorders to improve their overall sleep quality. And that needs to be capped off with the plus one, which is exactly what you said, Jonathan, is a group education session that not only takes in that data de-identified and says, look, guys, here is the data from this team. You guys are all sleeping an average of six hours and 50 minutes. We need to boost that up over seven hours. We've identified some things that need to change. We're going to change training times. We're going to treat some people with sleep disorders. But I'll give out people's names. But here's the things that you can do. Time in a caffeine, alcohol, drugs, you know, time of watching TV. And then maybe in two months or three months, objectively assess it again to see how we've 
gone up. And then we can correlate that down potentially with performance measures that are of interest to the coach, such as wins and losses, passes, body fat percentage, whatever the drivers are that they want to look at. But unfortunately, I find that many teams and many athletes just go, yeah, 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 yeah. What can I put in my room to make me sleep? It's like, it's not about that. It's about looking at these factors before we even, and we could actually just spend two hours talking in the first paragraph here, which we're doing at the moment, by the way, because we're not even talking about travel, timing of game, family, injury, age of athlete, all these other things. We're just talking about optimizing of training. And sorry to go on a bit of a rant, but I'm just trying to support the point that you guys are saying. And it just kind of frustrates me why people talk about the importance of it, but don't actually put their money where their mouth is and actually do something about it. End of rant. (laughs) No, it's a brilliant rant. And I'm probably going to pick up with my own soapboxy rant based on the fact that we're interchangeably using these terms chronotype and preference, or if you want to say circadian or diurnal preference. And for me as a training clinician in behavioral sleep medicine in general, this is a hill I'll die on, Ian, truly. I don't actually think that our measures from a questionnaire perspective, the reduced morning evenness questionnaire or the Munich chronotype questionnaire are going to -to one-to-one always map on to quote-unquote biological chronotype, which is generally at this point, the gold standard is a dim light melatonin onset assay. We're obviously not getting that in most of, to all of these investigations, the, the DILMO, the dim light melatonin onset information. So we're relying upon somebody's preference. That is misleading at times. And so I think a low hanging fruit from a kind of athlete sport sleep performance perspective is to better characterize chronotype using improved methodology to actually biologically determine one's chronotype and determine if there's a mismatch between one's chronotype and circadian or diurnal preference. Because I think you're going to see by better alignment on those two factors, the biology and the psychology, you're going to remove a lot of the issues we're already mm-hmm. you know, talking about. We're also going to have a better clarity on who do we shift, right? Say Ian walks in and Jesse gives him the reduced morning evenness questionnaire and Ian shows up to be more evening this preference. I don't get that sense from you even, but who knows, right? But then I actually look at your DILMO, your dim light melatonin onset, and it shows more morningness tendencies. Well, now I can come back to Ian and be like, well, wait a minute, actually. And I think you're living inconsistently with your biology. And perhaps just that slight adjustment could be enough to improve and enhance performance. Mm. But from understanding what to do at a kind of team-based level from scheduling practices or trainings or so on, I don't think we should be relying upon diurnal preference, the subjective measures. I think we should be getting more into the granularity of the biology and the physiology and better understanding one's actual true chronotype. Do you think just on this point of chronotype, do you think mid-sleep being calculated from the actigraphy variables will be, I know it's not perfect because it might be you know impacted by other factors, training time and family and whatever, but do you think that will be somewhat more of an objective measure than the chronotype questionnaires? Well said. Brilliant. I, I do think it's more reliable than, say, somebody's reduced morning evenness questionnaire score. Yeah. I still think it's fal- fallible to overstating one's chronotype, right? Because we're still capturing preference here in some regard of how mm. somebody's organizing their sleep and wake schedule. Yeah. So it's it's still a subjective psychological component being influencing that variable. I just think there's maybe less error than just delivering that questionnaire. Yeah. And just on training. So some people might, might be asking themselves, well, these guys are talking very much about frameworks and hypothetical approaches and so on, but how do these athletes actually sleep during training? Are they getting more or less sleep during training? And do we have any sense of the average sleep that athletes are getting? Because this is a question that we get asked a lot. I'll start and then I'll pass the microphone to Jonathan on this one. I hate to say it, but it's going to be variable, right? Like I think based upon the training demand that is placed on the people, we saw in our review various dynamics between training load, uh, which is a term that's heterogeneous, right? Like training load is going to vary based upon sport and whatever that means. But generally speaking in research is described as like higher low training load periods. 
uh, whatever that means. In the higher periods, they seem to sleep worse more times than not. No surprise there. Um, I think a lot of that comes from the constraints of the training or they're often training late into the evening, closer to their bedtimes. As you pointed to earlier, Ian, they have other obligations in life, family, friends, socialization. They're humans, so maybe they have bedtime aversion as well. They want to stay up and watch Netflix forever. Who knows, right? Uh, but in low training periods, people tend to sleep better. Uh, yet at the same time, there's um, always going to be negative influence from the demands of training on that front and also the psychosocial factors of like, am I training? Is my training improving my performance? Which leads to the anxiety aspect of preparing for a competition. If I'm not getting the effects I want from my training, I'm not running faster. I'm not making Mm -hmm. more shots. I'm not scoring more goals. Is that making me more anxious, which in turn or stressed is leading to poor sleep quality at night. So we see a lot of different electrical effects there. One thing I will say, and that's really encouraging. I was actually pretty surprised when doing this review about some of the reported total sleep times across not just training periods, but competitive periods as well, whereby a lot of these athletes were actually achieving sleep within kind of the uh, thresholds of healthy sleep duration for people of their ages based on the National Sleep Foundation. There was a lot of over seven hours of total sleep time. Now, athletes may need more, probably Mm -hmm. need more, given the like increased of homeostatic drive from the effects of physical performance and so on. But I think this is encouraging. It's a sign of a changing tides, if you will, that this stuff is becoming more at the forefront. Because again, our review is only looking at the last five years. Yeah. And the fact that the vast majority was disseminating information that suggests that athletes are sleeping over seven hours a night, that to me is kind of a win. That some of this information is becoming more in the know and appreciated by professional athletes. So I'm kind of encouraged by that. Oh, that's good. That's um, that's good to know. So, because I think a lot of people out there would think that um, you know, elite athletes or professional athletes are sleeping like ten hours a night. They just assume that they're these perfect, healthy specimens. And like I've said to people, just because they're professional doesn't mean they're healthy. I said I've seen many elite athletes or professional athletes that are quite sick and get sick a lot because they're running their system at a red line. I said, you know, health and where we kind of um you were saying about interchangeably like with chronotypes, but I think we do the same as well. We look at a guy and think, oh, he's got a six pack or an eight pack or a female elite athlete and she's like a gun in the swimming pool or whatever she's doing, whatever, how they look, the, the height, the weight, the 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 uh, aesthetic look at them and we equate that with health. You might look great, but you might be in a really bad, you know, from a health perspective, you might be really bad mentally and physically and might be very sick. So just because someone's got a, a six pack, male or female, doesn't mean that that, is, that equates to health. So- but it's good to see no, that, truthfully, it, that, that like, these are moving like, up. Yeah. And I'll say, it's hard to interject, Ian, but like hand up here. Like in my first two years of graduate school, I was like starting to explore the world of triathlons. I had always been a baseball player, golfer, those types of things early on in my athletic performance. And in that journey, I started to explore triathlons. That requires a ton of commitment from a mm. training perspective and to juggle like managing a research laboratory social relations, all that kind of stuff. Well, I sucked and I shortchanged sleep, right? Yeah. And so I started to have five to six hours of sleep tonight when I know that I operate best at seven and a half. And this is just like a salient example of like, I'm not a professional athlete, but that's the exact same stuff that professional athletes have to juggle or consider. It's encouraging to me that I imagine if we did this review, Jonathan, maybe 10 years ago, we'd probably see differential results in what we saw in the data whereby we probably see more of the five to six hours of total sleep time on average across these types of groups. And we actually saw probably more times than not about six and a half to seven hours of total sleep time. This is still probably below their biological need, given that athletes are a bit different, but it's still encouraging that it's becoming more forefront of kind of uh, intentionality, if you will. And the culture is shifting towards sleep, but there is again, a lot of work to be done. And one of the things that, that we notice as, as researcher and clinician is, and we did it throughout this conversation, is we throw in the 
family variable as on the side of the bus almost. When I'm working with athletes, and I'm sure you do also, Ian, you can notify those who have a family and those who does not have a family, and you see the major impact it has on their sleep schedule. And then what I'm talking about family is do you only have, do you only, do you have a wife with kids or do you have a partner with no kids? This makes also a huge difference. And this is where to me the almost full-time or full-time sleep clinician comes into play is when you assess an athlete, you do not only assess the athlete, you assess the entire household. Because mm -hmm. if you have a, a athlete sharing a bed with a uh, snorer or someone who has sleep apnea, they're gone. You can provide them with the best sleep uh, technique, the best sleep uh, suggestion or intervention. If the problem remains the snorer or a kid that has night terror, you need to be able to act on those in the household. And this is one of the reasons why veterans often play more, uh, they have more uh, outcomes on the, on the road rather than at home because in the hotel room, they finally can sleep safe and well, safe and sound. They can sleep better because they don't have all these other disruptors. And then for the rookies, it's different. At home, they have their own environment. It's settled, it's calm. There's nothing that will disturb them. But on the road, if you're playing Vegas, then it's Vegas and you're a rookie. Yeah. And there you go, there goes your performance. So to me, this is where the sleep clinician becomes fundamental. It's you're not only looking at the athlete when you want to truly improve the performance. It's you're looking, do you have kids? Yes. What age are they? You have a partner in your bed. Well, how does she or he sleep? And does that impact you? And to me, this is the whole entire thing that we have yet to capture in research is, well, maybe this person reporting 6.5 or 8 hour. Well, they could report even higher because they're not disclosing, well, my kid did wake up three times last time. Yeah, I think this is um, this this kind of draws a lot of parallels to some other work I do in consulting and research, which is looking at shift workers. And particularly, we look at what's called fly and fly out, which is very prevalent here in Western Australia for mining oil and gas, where people go away for a week or two or up to a month, and then they're home for a period of time as well. And we see the very same thing, Jonathan. We see the people that have a family basically gone, I sleep better when I'm aware because I have less distractions. I work a 12 hour shift and then I'm off for 12 hours. My food is cooked. I don't do any washing up. My meals are all provided. Um, my room gets cleaned twice a week. All I have to do is go to the gym and, and basically wash my clothes once a week at the, at the laundry that's next to my room. So, and there's a dryer there as well. So like we, we dial down all of that extra no noise for them whilst they're at work. But you see other people then, um, the inverse happening was when they go home Sometimes young guys making lots of money are going to the casino and doing other things as well. So they're not sleeping very well or the night before they come to work. So they're bringing that inherent fatigue in. And I think there's lots of parallels across into elite sport with this. And um, so, yeah, it's the same thing. The other thing I would say as well, where we probably need to start moving towards with the elite athletes or professional athletes is not just educating and consulting with the individuals, but actually educating the families. Because this is what we see with the shift workers as well. Educating the families about what needs to happen. I know some athletes before I've said to them, like, do you live in a house? Yep. I make good money. I got a four or five bedroom house. So what do you do? Like when you have to get up early in the morning, oh, I like, get up, you know, and have a shower in the ensuite and blah, blah. So you wake your partner up or maybe she gets up for work or he gets up for work at four or 5 a.m. And they wake you up. Well, maybe on those nights where that's going to happen, can you sleep in a separate room? Oh yeah. Never thought of that. And it's simple things or as much as gone. You know, like my, what my wife and I do is, you know, in our house, we don't have any kids and we've got extra rooms. So basically, if someone's getting up early in the morning to, because my wife works for a mining company and she often goes away, if she's got to get up at four o'clock in the morning, she gets up and just leaves the room and goes and showers in the other shower and has her clothes in the other room. So she's not like turning on the lights and waking me up. And people like get, oh, oh, wow, I never thought of that. And these are simple little things we can do for people that can improve their sleep drastically for the number of awakenings or the quality or the duration. And it's simple low hanging fruit. And like we say, I often say to people in the hierarchy of recovery methodologies, sleep is number one. And unlike doing ice baths, cryotherapy, massage, physio, it doesn't cost anything, but you want to go and do all of those things that you have to pay for, but you won't do the things that are free. And I've said this a lot. So maybe we should start charging people, like I've said before, to sleep in their own bed and maybe then they'll start doing it because it seems like if they're paying for it, they'll actually then engage in it. 
But these are lots of things we can give people for free, I think, that would be very, very helpful, particularly at the top end. This is where more than one percenters, I think, can emerge. We start bringing everybody on this journey. End of rant number two. <laughs> Danny, and I gotta, I gotta just capitalize on on what you just said there because it was pure gold. <clears throat> this notion that we're willing to pay for all these tools and gadgets and experiences, like I'm looking for a, a finished hot cold shower soon at the Bergamot Spa because I love those things. Right, I'll pay for that. But when it comes to like our sleep health and things like that, we often are so phobic to like Mm. making such accessible changes as you pointed out of like, Hey, I still love you. But on two out of the seven nights of the week, we're going to sleep in different beds because like you're waking up then. And I just really want to sleep the rest of the night. It's not, doesn't change anything on our dynamics of relationship, whatever. These are the little nuances that I don't think are fully top of knowledge or comfortable for the general public. And we can do better about disseminating. I will say what you brought up about the whole um, kind of novel environment sleeping is really important when we start thinking about methodology too in the research space, because we're bringing people, as you pointed out, I think earlier, sometimes in best case scenarios, doing polysomnographic or even ambulatory or in-home polysomnographic evaluations of people. We're putting wires and sensors and all these things on them to better understand their sleep from the most comprehensive capacity. And for some, if we bring them into an artificial setting, like an in-lab, perhaps they are going to sleep better than they would otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so maybe we're not capturing the true sleep of that athlete if we're doing it in that manner. And maybe it's better served to do it in the in-home environment where you still have those distractions, you still have those complicating factors and so on to get a better sense of what their sleep actually looks like. There's that perspective of a first night effect of a polysomnography, but the reality is not everybody actually has that first night effect either. So it gets really complicated there, but these are just certain factors that we need to be mindful of as we progress this field forward of how do we want to best study the sleep of these individuals while reducing the noise of whether it's just removal of certain environmental factors and things like that. The only reason why you would bring an athlete into a level one, so in lab, is for a primary sleep disorder such as sleep apnea or IH or narcolepsy or or RBD, I know they don't have, or central sleep apnea. Otherwise, if you're doing that, systematically bring your athlete in a lab, I'm questioning your your understanding of what sleep is. It's at yeah. home where all the disruption is because this is where the money is. If you're bringing them in a lab away from the family and they sleep like a rock, well, this is a good sleeper. I don't have to do anything. Well, no, you just have a good sleeper because you provide them with the right environment. So as soon as they're going back home, yeah. then they're in all that noise. So the in-lab, just to make sure they don't have any underlying pre uh, premorbidities. Other than that, I am going back with what Ian said, 21 days at home. Yeah. And then you have the real picture and then you can start moving the, the needle. Yeah, I'm I'm a big fan, Jonathan, as well, of like level three or level two PSGs at home, uh, particularly for a few nights if possible, because I think it gives us a better picture. And unless we're bringing them in for a multiple wake, um, you know, multiple uh, uh, wakefulness test or a, MSLT, or we think they might have, you know, REM behavior disorder or sexomnia or one of these that are kind of, ab- not, I wouldn't say abstract, but one of these kind of more non, not so common disorders. Then by exception, we go, right, we need to put you into a level one PSG lab after we've done these things. But we're constantly kind of filtering or funneling people down. We've started with activity, active, activity and questionnaires. We have done like a level two PSG or level three PSG. We've seen some things that are not kind of fitting the, fitting the mold really for what we see. So by exception, then we want to push them off then to a level one to get these things um, sorted out um, and give them some more dedicated care really. Um, so I think you're right. Um and I think when people advocate for everybody needs to do a sleep study, I'm like, well, that's just actually an idiotic statement because you're wasting time, you're wasting money, and it's an artificial thing. Um, and and I and some people might say, well, Ian, you've done that before for studies. Yes, I have because I wanted to quantify the prevalence of sleep disorders using level one in a in a in a, in a team because it was never done before. So for research purposes, 
yeah, we might be trying to answer a question, but in practical applied chronobiology slash consulting world, it's not practical and it's not effective and it's a waste of money and it's a waste of time and you will piss people off. So once you go in trying to whitewash people and dip them like sheep, you will lose engagement. And this is a very important thing for any aspiring researcher in this field or a consultant or a physiologist or someone that's looking at it from a strength and conditioning point of view. You do not have to apply the same methodology to everybody. You have to have a structured methodology. So think about an inverted V or a funnel chip where you know you are systematically approaching these problems, catching everybody, and then funneling down by exception to treat everybody. It's like you're not going to go out and give everybody chemotherapy because everybody's over 50 and you think they have prostate cancer. You don't do that. Some people might, though. But see, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. It's like you don't apply the same treatment for everybody. End of rant. Yeah, rant number three. three. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say rant number three. But no, it's, it's brilliant. I mean, this is like the elephant in the room and challenging. Like in an ideal world, we can apply level one comprehensive assessment in home. But we can't. We just we just we have yeah. to acknowledge that limitation right now. And I love the way you unpack that, Ian, because that's the way we should approach this is let's go like a rule out approach with the funneling technique. And let's only identify those of need. Say like Anthony Bennett was a first overall draft pick by the Cleveland Cavaliers, I think like, I don't know, 2000, I don't know, like a decade ago plus. And it only became unearthed later on that he had obstructive sleep apnea. We could probably have determined that from a home sleep apnea test when we were level yeah. threes, right? And I'm sure with the winning approach, we would have landed on that at some point. The conclusion would have been made, and we're good to go from there. But there are certain situations where there are athletes who do experience narcolepsy, as Jonathan ex- alluded to, that require the true comprehensive nature of an in-laboratory PSG, which a you know comprehensive clinical history that a trained sleep physician can unpack and make that diagnosis and give the appropriate treatment. We need to do better about funneling that as you pointed out. And I love that kind of terminology and structure, not just in the athlete space, but in the general population yeah. space as well. Yeah. Ex- exactly. Jesse. And I will just say, as you were talking there as well as I, I was just going to reiterate the fact that I'm not just talking about athletes, I'm talking about in other populations as well. So if you're if you're a if you if you own a company or you're a medical practitioner or you're doing pre-employment medicals, this is a good structure to do. As people are coming in and you might be a medical provider for XYZ company and you're providing pre-employment medical service or routine or periodic medicals, this is something you can do as well. And the important factor, the important point here, it's not to discriminate in any shape, way, or form. It's not a process used to eliminate people from employment or from being a draft pick. It's about identifying the issues or the challenges that someone has so we can treat them and optimize them further. So if someone's the number one draft pick for a for a sport and they have sleep apnea, I'd be saying, imagine how good it could be if we treat their sleep apnea or their insomnia. This person could surpass the Tom Brady's and the Michael Jordans. This person could be like, you know, the new goat of all time, the new greatest of all time for the sport. So we have to be careful as well that it's not a tool that's used punitively either because this sometimes happens in industry. Oh, he's got sleep apnea. She's got insomnia. You know, they've got this, that, 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 not have a higher end them. No, no, no. Are they a good operator? Are they qualified? Have they got experience? Will they fit your team? Yes. Well, these things are easy to treat. We can treat them. You know, you're not going to eliminate other people for this. And I think in the areas of, and I know we'll get onto this as well. I think sometimes in the area of, we'll say sleep, mental health, and even diet nutrition, if people are overweight or obese for a certain role and they can't do it, we tend to kind of push those away because that's health and that's a little bit more complex and people are biological. But if it's a safety thing like, hey, Jonathan, I tested your eyes. Your vision's not great. We'll employ you if you wear glasses every day. Jonathan goes, okay, put those glasses on. That's easy. I guess an easy fix is tangible. But if it's something that's a little bit more nuanced or a bit more difficult, we tend to like, oh, I don't want to deal with that. Where in actual fact, we can deal with it. We should deal with it. Not only can we optimize them as an athlete or an employee, but we can even help them more in their life because we could potentially identify something that's going to you know, impact our overall health. So we're making them a better person at the end of the day as well. So the value proposition is there for it. It's just our approach to it needs, needs to change. 